Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome at the last session of the day around uh, medicinal cannabis. My favorite subject, I'm Sonny Moonhout from Cultivators. We're active in this field, so happy to present here four experts, which will come on stage, talk about different subjects, um, ranging from um, growing substrate towards biological uh, solutions for IPM control, but also um, other experts, uh, especially in research. Uh, Arno Hazekamp will be later on stage. Um, a lot of things to talk about around medicinal cannabis, a fairly new crop, and therefore I would like to invite the first speaker, René Korste from Delphi. He is a senior consultant, flowers, but also um, bio-based compounds, as you guys uh, call it. Um, he will be representing for us how getting higher yield with medicinal cannabis. Floor is yours, Ney. Yes, okay, thank you, uh, Sonny. So uh, as I'm introduced, yes, I was missing already. Uh, René Costa, Delphi, uh, we're a consultancy company active uh, in the horticultural industry. And I'm going to tell something about uh, uh, optimal growing of medicinal cannabis. Uh, but first, a short introduction of me. So as already mentioned by Sonny, I'm a senior consultant in Chrysanthemum. That's basically my uh, most important crop. And a few years ago, I get the question, uh, are you interested in uh, consultancy in uh, medicinal cannabis? And well, after 30 years chrysanthemum and some similarity between the crop, I was interested, of course. Well, I'm going to talk about how to optimize the growing. And first uh, point I would uh, like to mention is that when I'm visiting uh, LPs, that mostly there's a lot of focus on humidity and the focus on temperature is mostly that they want to get the temperature as high as possible. While in our, uh, from our point of view from Delphi, uh, we think uh, from three balances, energy balance, water balance and assimilate balance. And the most important balance for us is the net assimilate balance. All three are important, but this one, from our point of view, is the most important. And I would like to tell why. Uh, when you look at the assimilate balance, then you have on one side the photosynthesis. It's the light, CO2, CO2 and humidity. And on the other side, you have the dissimulation, the respiration, the burning of sugars. And this one is especially uh, temperature related and not uh, CO2, light, or humidity related, as the assimilate, uh, assimilation is also not temperature related. So what happens when the temperature, when you're growing at a much higher temperature than uh, basically needed? Assimilation is not increasing, dissimulation is increasing, and the result is basically a lower net assimilate balance, and the result of that is less sugars which are available for making a good plant. Basically, it's the same like uh, you are baking a, a bread. One day you have to bake a bread with uh, one liter of milk uh, and one liter of flour. The next day you have the half and you still have to make the same bread. The bread becomes less tasty. And basically what you see when you're growing at a higher level than basically needed, your plant is more vulnerable for diseases and maybe also the amount of uh, cannabinoids will be less high. Well, I have a short uh, example. I'm not going to explain this all because I only have 10 minutes. But here I try to, uh, to show that as a basic temperature, we are looking at 21 degrees. And for each thousand joules, you can make the 24-hour uh, temperature, two and a half degrees higher. So you get the situation on a very sunny day in a greenhouse in the generative stage. You can go up, for example, to a 24-hour uh, temperature of 28 degrees. But on a winter day in the same greenhouse with less light, you have to make the temperature more low. Well, the same for indoor growing. It depends on the light level on which temperature you want to grow. Well, is this all? Uh, no, that's not all. 
also important is CO2 levels. So I was one time, and you see a lot of differences in uh, knowledge level in uh, cannabis growing, but one time I even visit an LP. I was mentioning, put CO2 into your uh, indoor farm, and they were afraid that people were going to faint. Well, that's of course ridiculous, but it gives uh, a sight of the knowledge uh, uh, which are import for, important for growing good plants. And CO2 is a very important one. So for example, from Lily, we know that a light level without CO2, uh, for example, of 6,000 uh, lux, sorry for mentioning the lux, uh, is the same as 4,000 lux with CO2. And there is no crop at all which doesn't benefit from good CO2 levels. And I have here a uh, short example, and it's from chrysanthemum, and there you see that when you have a CO2 level of 400 ppm, that uh, you have, and this 400 ppm, when you make it 100%, then you see when you can go up to 800 ppm, that the assimilation and the production is going up with 50%. So a good CO2 level is very important also. Uh, and it makes your plant healthy. But then still you see situations that you get botrytis in your uh, flowers, and still you were measuring humidity, temperature, CO2, everything was in order, but still you had the problem. Well, then you come to the solution, I think, in my opinion, that calcium is one of the most important elements in making strong flowers. And when you talk about calcium, we talk about calcium and evaporation. So with high light levels on daytime, calcium is not being transported to the flower. The same with tomato, you can have this problem on the very light days. You get problems with calcium in your tomato, a shortage. Well, the same with botrytis and uh, cannabis. You have to bring your calcium into the flower at night. And at night, you can do this by night evaporation. And what you basically see is, for example, that when your night evaporation is too low, your humidity can be in control, your temperature can be okay, everything can be okay, but how many energy do you put into your greenhouse or, or your growing uh, facility, and how many humidity is taken out of the growing room? Well, therefore, you need this night evaporation, and the stronger night evaporation gives a stronger flower, which is less vulnerable for botrytis. Well, 10 minutes. I see I only have two uh, minutes still, so I still have just some time. Uh, it's short. We can talk about a lot more uh, topics because the crop is very, very interesting. But I don't want to withhold you this information. Within January 20, uh, uh, 2022, we will start at Delphi in Blijswijk uh, a long-term uh, research project on uh, medicinal cannabis uh, with a few partners, and the most important partners are these uh, six. And well, I hope to see you soon in Blijswijk next year to visit our trials and to discuss about the topics we, were, we are researching then. So thank you for your attention, and Sonny, it's for you again. Thank you, Rene, for your valuable insights into growing medicinal cannabis. Going to um, our next speaker, um, this is Ben Nikai from uh, Grodan, uh, leading substrate company producing stone wool. Um, actually, a good growing media to be able to steer on crop level. And I think Ben will give us all the information on how to really steer the root zone management and get higher yields and quality in cannabis. All right, great, Sonny. Thank you. Uh, well, since we have only 10 minutes, and in fact, I give quite a few presentations during the year, but most of the time they last between one hour and two hours, so I'll skip the introduction. Uh, we all know what it takes to have a good growing uh, indoors or in a greenhouse or to have a good crop. So certainly it takes 
the plant, the genetics, and we know the uniqueness of uh, cannabis. It's so diverse, and, and the plasticity of cannabis is very unique compared to all other crops. We have to have the controlled environment, so we have to have a good house with all uh, metrics inside it, temperature, humidity, light, CO2, and, and movement, air movement. We have to have the root zone, and certainly we have to have someone to make the right connection among, among those three factors. And to be honest, this is very crucial because you can have the best greenhouse in the world with all top, uh, and you can have the best uh, root zone, the best substrate or whatever, the best plant, but you need to have the, the best grower, you need to have the skilled grower to know how to put all those three factors in the right balance and in the right direction. So that's why I, I, I'm putting a bit of focus on the importance of the knowledge of the grower or the one who is going to, to, to drive the crop. As Grodan, uh, because we, we sell uh, uh, growing media, we have been doing this for more than 50 years, so we are specialized in root zone management, and uh, actually that's what I do most of my time, visiting customers and talking about water, water strategy and as well plants, even though we cannot separate because they all work together. But uh, yeah, what is the uh, root zone management? So yeah, we know that uh, root zone is the place where the roots are, uh, are r r the, the house of the roots, we can say. And the, the root zone management is to be able to maintain all those metrics that we see here in the right balance. So the, the, the amount of water which is in the media, the amount of nutrients which is in there, the pH, temperature, and, and bio life. So actually, all of those parameters are Inter interfering with each other. So you cannot only say I need to have fertilizers or just water or temperature. They all work together. Like, for instance, we talked a lot last few years about biolife. So yeah, yeah, the temperature, the oxygen, the, the, the water, but as well the plant itself is the one who is going to support that biolife. It's not only the root zone, it's not only the, the substrate, but a healthy plant, you are going to have a healthy biolife because it's just a symbiosis between the plant and and, and, and uh, bio life. Uh, then, yeah, if you have the, let's say, the right product, the right tools to measure, the right uh, grower or advice, we have created this precision root zone management, and in turn, we are going to have actually the best quality. We most of the time, I used to work in the vegetable industry, and we start by yield because that was most important in vegetable industry. But in cannabis, seems to be a bit different because uh, we are looking for, for cannabinoids for different products for flour and that quality comes number one so if you have the right root zone it really influences the quality certainly it influences the yield and resilient plant which they go together and why resilient plant when you have a healthy root system you have a healthy plant and then that healthy plant is going to be stronger and more vigorous against all kind of insect of disease which can be around that uh, that uh, plant it can s help you to save costs in energy, labor, water, and fertili fertilizers. Yeah, an example, why energy uh, or why labor? I think if you have a uniform crop, which is related to the, to the environment, but as well to root zone, if you start with a, with a uniform growing media, you are going to have a uniform crop from the start. Therefore, it is to be easier for the workers later on to do the, the job or as well to do the last, the harvesting or trimming or all the all the operations that come afterwards. The environment, we talk a lot about, a lot about sustainability. We talk about uh, yeah, how to, to produce the, the, the most sustainable possible. And absolutely, when you have a precision growing, when you give the plant exactly what it needs, not more, not less, you are going to save in water and fertilizers. And at the end of the day, it's going to help you to, to have that, the right uh, water footprint to, reduce, to have the best water use efficiency. Uh, as I said, in Grodan, we have been working for like more than 50 years already, and we have created that watering strategy, and everything has to do with this uh, graph. What happens during the, the, during the 24 hours in the, in that, in the life cycle of, uh, of the plant, in the root zone of the plant? At the same time, we have a graph for the whole cycle of the crop, but that's to take a much longer time. But first of all, this is the basics, the foundation of really the, 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 the water management. So what happens during those 24 hours? So we have divided in three parts. So we have the part one, that moment when you give the first irrigation until we saturate uh, the, the substrate or we replace what was lost during the night. 
We have the second part, which the most, the part where the plant is the most active. Most of the time is around three, three hours, four hours after the lights are on or the, the sunrise. And then we have that uh, dry time, which is from the last irrigation to the one in the morning. I put the fo uh, focus those circles in the, let's say, the green one, the blue and the red, because everybody, every grower who is dealing with plants, they really need to know at what time they have to start, what time they have to get the first drain, and what time they have to stop. And very often, this is the main question when I visit customers, what time do we have to start to water? Uh, yeah, it's, it's not that easy. We have, uh, let's say, we have tried to develop all kinds of uh, ways to, to explain it. It's related to the amount of light. It's, uh, it can be on time, it can be on uh, 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 water uptake. The most important, I always say, is we have to water the moment the plant is full active, so full transpiring. It's crucial because uh, transpiration, that means the plant is active, you give the first water, plant can use that water, and then you don't have that root pressure, which can be the cause of botrytis or all kinds of disease in, in afterwards. So it's really important to water no matter what time. Normally it's between one hour to two hours after the sun goes on, on the sunrise or lights go on, but very important to see if the plants are active. And to see if the plants are active, you have to look at the water content in the substrate with the sensor, for instance, to see if that water content is going down. And you see here the water content right after the lights go on, it goes down quickly. And then you give those first irrigation, then you have to know what time the drain arrives. Very important because the drain helps to, to maintain the EC in the substrate. If you want to build, sometimes you want to build the EC higher, then you get less drain. Sometimes you want to lower the EC, you get more drain. But as well, it helps to, to flush out all kind of uh, yeah, toxic products which were built maybe during the night or, or this kind of things. Then normally during the period two, we water a lot. This is the period that we water the most. So most of the time, we, we never stress the plant during the time. So we satisfy the plant with water. And then period two, period three is what sometimes we call it, we call it dry back. So it's between 20 to 30% or 35%. And I would say this is the stress that you give to a plant. I hear a lot in cannabis uh, world, they talk about stressing the crop, which, yeah, I, I, I don't like the word stress because in, in the sense that stressing the crop is okay a little bit, but not, not too much. So a little bit of stress is okay, but really not too much. So you have to know when to stress the plant. You can, the stress, you can stress the plant maybe during, after the last irrigation till the morning, or a little, between, a little bit between two cycles, but never stress the plant during the, the full growing, like a vegetative stage or, or the beginning of flowering. Maybe stressing, you should more do it the last two weeks of, of life to help to produce those secondary metabolites. But if you stress too much, it's going to affect your, your biomass, and at the end, it's going to affect your production. So be careful with the word stress and not, not do it too much. Uh, well, we use uh, that uh, root zone management or that uh, way of uh, strategy we use as well to steer the crop in the right direction. So by playing with the uh, frequency, with the size of watering, we can steer the crop on a vegetative way or in a generative way. So during the life cycle, even though cannabis, we talk about the vegetative stage, which is around maybe two to four weeks, and about the flowering stage, which is about eight to 10 weeks. So it doesn't mean that during the generative stage, for instance, you are not going to steer the plant vegetative, or vice versa, during the vegetative stage, you don't need to steer the plant generative. So actually, during the, even during the 24 hours of life cycle of a plant, there are some moments that you have to steer the plants either vegetative or generative, because you always need to have some leaf area, or you need to have some generative steering, even during the vegetative or generative. So, yeah, you can see it. It's a long discussion, but the time is running out. And uh, as uh, the most important, I would say, in, when you work with soilless culture, you re really have to measure. So you have, to, we, there is an expression to measure is to know by measuring, by using sensors, that you, you are going to find what's happening inside that root system and what's happening with the activity of the plant. So this is, uh, crucial when you work in soil sculpture. And one reason when I have this slide, I remember my first year when I started to work, uh, maybe 22 years ago, I was a grower in Canada, and that sensor to measure water content are, was my best companion. I was measuring at least two, three times per day the water content, EC and pH, and I would advise to everybody who was working in soilless or hydroponics to use sensor as much as possible to know what's happening in, 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 in root zone media. Thank you very much. So I'm right on time. So uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for your insights on uh, root Thanks, zone man. management. Um, that brings us to uh, the next subject, uh, which will be about uh, biologicals. 
So I will invite uh, Jeanette Dauma from Corporate Biological Systems. Um, she's going to talk about the latest insights in biocontrol for medicinal cannabis and one of the yeah, key things will be probably about uh, the cannabis aphid, which is uh, an aphid which yeah, harms the crop quite a bit uh, everywhere in the world. So floor is yours, Jeanette. Thank you, uh, Sonny. Okay, uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to tell you something about intercrop, uh, integrated crop management systems in medicinal cannabis. Uh, my name is Jeanette Dauma. I've been working for Coppert for quite a long time. And, uh, well, I was busy with cannabis for a, a couple of years. Um, le let me tell you something about Coppert Biological Systems. Uh, we, we've been started in 1967. Father Coppert was allergic against uh, chemicals. Uh, he was a cucumber grower and he was looking for alter alternatives. He went to uh, Switzerland, found a predatory mite, which was very good working against uh, spider mite, put it in, in, in his uh, uh, car, came back in the, in the cucumber crop and it was working. So he gives leaves to the, to the neighbor and that's the first start of our company. Uh, well, Co Father Coppert passed away quite quickly and now we are still a family business and our third uh, 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 generation is now uh, the, the board. Uh, in in, the, in this four, four 54 years we have uh, grown quite a lot, 2,000 employees are working right now for Coppert and 650 in the Netherlands. Uh, and we changed actually from only uh, looking at pests and diseases also into a uh, more hol holistic approach is that we look to the whole plant instead of only uh, um, the natural enemies. And that, uh, well, that resulted that we have about 30, 30 subsidiaries right now all over the world situated in all um, uh, regions. Uh, and we are selling in uh, almost 100 countries, uh, subsidiaries uh, everywhere. Well, if you look at this picture, you can see that, um, well, there, uh, that's actually our portfolio when you look at the pest, uh, the pest control. So you see on the left-hand side, you see a list with all kinds of pests, and on the right-hand side, you see the solutions. This means these are predatory mites or insects, which can control uh, the, um, the specific um, pests. Let's take the, the second row. This is the spider mite. Um, and therefore, we develop specific products for the cannabis, uh, like you see here. Um, these, uh, these sachets contain a small production of predatory mites, which are very good working when you hang them around in the, in the, in the, uh, in the crop like this. Um, they, the predatory uh, mites can walk out through a hole in the, in the sachet, can walk out into the crop and do their job. While doing it preventively, you never run out of uh, spider mite because they can find the spider mites much easier than we can uh, by looking uh, by the eye. So uh, while uh, introducing this sachet, your, your, your spider mite will be under control. Another advantage is that you don't have any carrier material on the crop because you don't like that, especially not on the flowers, of course. Um, and we are also using different kinds of application techniques. Uh, um, well, we have blowing machines in order to, to um, uh, distribute our products, but also monitoring techniques like the Horivare uh, um, sticky traps in order to find if there are any flying pests available uh, uh, available as well. So how do we develop this, um, these products? Um, and that's always in cooperation with growers. Uh, gr we, we are going to growers frequently. We visit them on a regular basis. And they are telling us, well, we do have problems, especially with pests and diseases. And how, please, can you help us? Uh, so that's a kind of, you know, uh, back and forth with the, with the grower. And then we go uh, together, think about it with our international consultants um, and exchange knowledge if we can uh, solve the problem. And if not, we will start a project and uh, go, uh, go forward with our 
um, R&D to, to find this an, another solution than we already have in portfolio. And sometimes we also work together with, uh, with other third parties like um, uh, René Korsten from Delphi already was mentioning uh, to find out the right way uh, to grow. And also we are participating in LCC with Arno will tell more about later. And that at, uh, at the end may, uh, will lead to integrated crop management and to a better protocol to protect the cannabis crop. Well, some examples. One was already mentioned by Sony, yeah, the Verroden cannabis aphids, which is actually a big, big problem. Here you see how it lo looks like. And what we do is that we first start with checking um, different natural enemies or either fungi or maybe uh, bacteria, which will work against uh, these uh, cannabis aphids in s on small basis. So we start in petri dishes, then we go to cages, and at the end we, st we do this... Um, uh, at, at the grower side, because we want to work together with the grower in order to find the right, uh, the right solution. This results for, especially for rodent cannabis, already in the uh, um, Grisopa X. Grisopa is a lace wing, and uh, if you uh, distribute the X into your crop, you hardly can see any carrier, but because there is no carrier inside, but then the egg hatches, and the, the larvae, which you see on the screen right now, hatch from that and will feed on the cannabis aphid. The big advantage from this, uh, uh, this larvae is that they are not specifically dedicated to one aphid, but they are uh, feeding on more aphids. So when you do have, uh, instead of only Ferodon, also maybe another species of aphid, then they can, can feed on it. And there's also a question mark because we are still in, in, in this project busy, busy with finding new other solutions and we are close to, to end this project. So in the near future, you can expect some more developments uh, from our sites from that. Another example is um, the root aphids. Some of the growers will wrap up their, uh, their rock wool completely in order to get rid of these uh, root aphids. Uh, and what we did, well, it's more or less the same way of working as we, as we did with the, with the uh, um, Grisopa. And there we found out that uh, Sticky Trap uh, is the yellow thing, what you see there is uh, a hoary fair um, disc, we call it. You put it on the rock wool or on the substrate and the uh, root aphid is not able, well, is disturbed, I should say, to walk into your plant. And we are still developing new uh, uh, solutions for that. The last uh, experiment I would like to, to share with you is about uh, rooting, especially when you cut the um, uh, you make the cuttings, you want to have the, the, the rooting, of course. And with the help of the product of Filiparvo, it's a biostimulant, you can, in, you can get more and sooner rooting. So we have al done already some uh, um, experiments with that. It, it, with that. It looks very promising, so we will do more experiments in the, in the future in order to get uh, better rooting in the, in the, uh, in the substrate. What brings that? So uh, making these trials together with the growers we, uh, brings that to uh, a new protocol. Uh, and the protocol uh, will be reviewed every, t uh, every second month in order to get all the knowledge together and available for our international consultants so they can uh, uh, well share this information with their clients all over the world. Um, and so that's, that's quite important uh, part. Um, we, they are also in, in a part of a crop team, that's how we call, call it, and, and tells everybody, oh, do you know this or that? That's, that's the way how we work. So we, we try to make the global network of international consultants and uh, uh, together with the people uh, we are um, dealing with uh, um, outside as well. Well, we are visit growers regularly and based on now, if we can vi may visit the, the, the greenhouse, sometimes it's not allowed, of course, we can give them a, a, a good advice, but also we can give the discussion uh, ahead in the, ca in the canteen as well. 
So uh, that brings us, uh, well, uh, to with our core values which we have, um, we would like to, together with the growers, find the good solutions. So please give us the right questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Please stay with us for the Q&A oh. afterwards. Yeah. Then um, we're coming to the last speaker of uh, this afternoon for this medicinal cannabis session. I can say it's one of the experts in medicinal cannabis, worked for one of the, the only uh, medicinal cannabis producer, Bedokan, in the past. And um, yeah, Arno will tell us more about what he's doing currently and also um, about medicinal cannabis production. So Thank you. Floor Thank is you, yours. Sunny. Yeah, everybody is uh, telling me that this uh, green tech is a little bit uh, small this year, but this is only my second one. The only thing I know is I'm meeting lots of uh, interesting people uh, that I talk to, so uh, thank you very much for being here. It's great to meet you. I'm asked today uh, to tell you about the Legal Cannabis Coalition, or as we like to abbreviate it, the LCC. Um, there's three words in that, Legal Cannabis and Coalition, the most important one is the third one, it's a coalition, it's not any company by itself, it's a collaboration of different partners with different expertises working on cannabis. We do it when it's legal, so we don't pick medicinal or recreational or CBD. If it's legal in your country, in your region, we can help. Uh, and although it says cannabis, all our partners have also experience outside of the field of, of cannabis. So if you build greenhouses, you also build them for non-cannabis projects. If you run a lab and you're part of the LCC, you're also doing non-cannabis products. So you're good in your field of expertise and you apply it to cannabis and we do that together under one umbrella. And the idea is to do better business together. Um, I like to usually compare that to a one-stop shop so any client that comes and says, I have a license, I have a piece of land, I'm situated in Greece, now I don't need just one thing or two things, I need a whole bunch of things. Where do I get my seeds? What kind of a growing facility do I need? What kind of tables, ventilation, lab analysis? So you got to help me uh, with these things. Another analogy is a toolbox. You know, we have a, 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 a saw, a hammer, a screwdriver. So if you have a task, we can probably do something for you. And if we don't have that tool, we can look for it in the form of a member that is really, really good in what you need. And we add it to the mix, and we become a group of trusted suppliers. And we don't just refer to each other because we happen to a member of the same club, but because we know each other from the market. We've seen you in action. We have met each other in tomato greenhouses and in pharma products. So we know what we recommend, so we know that our services go well together. So we have four main focuses for our members and therefore also for our clients. That is business and leads. Of course, we want to sell more products. We want to sell more knowledge, but we want to do that in an integrated manner so that everybody benefits. We do marketing and PR. For example, we're here at the Green Tech. A lot of our members have their own stands, but they're talking about their flowers and their tomatoes and their pharma products, but they also want to present themselves in the field of cannabis, and they leave that partially up to the LCC. We do some research. I'm going to give you three examples in the next uh, slides that I think are uh, interesting to highlight. And we do education among ourselves. We teach each other about what do we do, how do we do it. Everybody needs to know about GMP, but nobody is the expert. Well, then let's have a course. Let's invite some speakers and see what we need to know. And we have a lot of projects with trade schools, Hogeschole in Dutch, uh, Wageningen University, and we love to have students. So I've talked to a lot of students in the last two days, um, and we want to give them meaningful experiences so they can really grow and develop in this field because they are the future of the cannabis industry. So we have a lot of members. Um, this is a long list, but we, we categorize them in three main uh, categories. And one is we help to prepare your project, your business plan, thinking about your land, thinking about you know what kind of things do I need to build before I can even put the plants in. Number two, I'm growing the plants. I have to take care of it. I have to make sure I meet my targets. And three, what am I going to do with that plant once I cut it down and it's going into the processing area? And all these three categories, we have partners that can help. 
What's a really important part of that also is that we don't just have things we sell, we also have research licenses. In the group, there are six research licenses for cannabis, so we can handle the material, we can grow the plants, we can't sell it to the market, but we do have boxes full of cannabis. We do have growing cells and greenhouses that we can use to grow the plant. We have equipment, laboratory equipment, drying equipment, we have experts in the group. Uh, and we have spaces that you need, like secured spaces, ventilated spaces, climate control spaces, and all those things combined within the group makes us able to do quite amazing experiments that are really difficult to do for any partner by themselves. Just getting the license can take you up to one or one and a half years before you even can get started. So we can build on knowledge. Um, whoops. The first example, this is also how the LCC came together, is that some of our members, even before there was an LCC, they started to go into the world, they built greenhouses, they installed tables, ventilation systems, uh, drying cabinets, and they came home and they said, you know, I observed that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And they talked to their colleagues in this field and they say, yeah, I see the same thing and I think I have an idea why this could be. But, you know, I am not the LP, so I don't have all the information, but what if we do a trial together and we start to figure out if our thoughts could actually be true. How can we optimize cannabis growth? How can we make a better crop for a lower price? Um, so that's why they came together. It's a very Dutch thing to do. You pool your resources, you work together with a university like Wageningen, Agricultural University, and you do an experiment. It ended up seven different harvests over two years in three greenhouses, summer and winter. So there was a lot to learn about how can we make cannabis uh, cultivation optimal. We finally brought in 16 different varieties so we could test nutrients and wind movement and uh, biological pest control to try to find out when does it work and when does it not work. And that made us much smarter. But when the experiments started to run out, you can't do research forever, we thought, well, how do we keep this energy together? And we came up with the idea of a membership-based legal cannabis coalition. Another thing we noticed during these uh, trials is that sometimes you have a variety, somebody has a variety that they would love to bring into your research trial, but they think, you know, this is such a special plant, what if I give it to you and somebody steals a tiny little piece and they have a clone and they took my variety? How am I ever going to make sure that my variety stays mine? So we worked with a Canadian uh, a laboratory that we have good partnerships with and they said we can develop uh, a DNA scan methodology so you can prove that your plant is yours. But we have limited genetics in Canada. It's just a Canadian pool of genetics. Could you help us bringing in a bunch of new samples? And we did so. We sent it to Canada. They developed a DNA analysis. And if you combine that with chemical analysis, with pictures and with breeding history, you get something that looks very much like a passport. Now we can prove that this plant is this particular type and it belongs to you. So it opens up the way to be much more open in sharing genetics, even when you could be scared that your special genetics will run off by itself and you can't trace it. Of course, the first two experiments, both the cultivation and the DNA passport, depends on laboratory analysis. You need to know how many cannabinoids did I produce, what's the percentage, what's the ratio of THC to CBD, and how many terpenes did I create, because the value of cannabis is in the chemical composition. It's great if it's purple or smells like strawberry, but that's all chemistry, and we need to measure that. But everybody in the cannabis industry knows if you send a sample to five different labs, you get five different results. So we thought we can't do that to ourselves and to our clients. We can't say you're good and you're bad because we're all just trying our best. So what we did is an alternative approach. We started our own laboratory uh, uh, comparison study. So we took the exact same samples, sent them to three labs. One of them is a member of the LCC, and the other two are official laboratories in Holland. And we tried to find out where are the differences, and if there are any, how can we fix that? So these are the results on the screen. Um, the results are quite close together and getting even closer over time because we're learning, we're openly talking about these things, and we're getting better as we go. Round two is uh, underway, and a few new laboratories in Holland want to join us uh, in the next round. So this was my presentation. I'm Arno Hazekamp. We're at stand 01126. I have some time left. Uh, it was great to meet you. And if you want to know anything more about our research projects or knowledge development, please come and talk to me afterwards.
Th thank you, Arno, for your insights in uh, cannabis research. May I ask the other speakers to, to come to the stage <coughs> so that we can start our Q&A session? Already some uh, questions coming in from the online community, but um, let's see if there are questions here in the audience. not working. Now it's working? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Arno, what was the name of the Canadian lab that does DNA analysis? It's called uh, Research and Productivity Council, RPC. Okay. They're in the New Brunswick. They're a little bit like TNO in Holland, so they're a very large research lab that does all sorts of things, including cannabis chemical analysis. Thank you very much. Do we have more questions in the audience for the speakers? Then I'll, I will have a question. Uh, ben, um, René talked about botrytis in cannabis. How does uh, root zone management and irrigation strategies influence botrytis? Is there a relationship? Uh, certainly, yes. Uh, I, I think in cannabis, botrytis is a, a bit unique because it uh, happens before you, you see it. And yeah, the, the, I think the water management can help because we know that botrytis is, let's say, a little bit related to the, the water pressure and as well to the climate, the temperature difference between there and the flowers. So we have to have a good combination of, of that, actually. You have to make sure that, as I said, start time and stop time is on time to avoid that uh, root pressure. But I would really mention again, the temperature difference between the air and inside those flowers is most important than anything else. But yeah, the keeping the right EC and the right water management, it, it helps. Yeah. Do you want to comment, uh, Arno? Yeah, because something I didn't say about uh, the Wageningen University cannabis trials is, of course, we try to improve the yield for a lower cost. But one of the things we also introduced was all kinds of scanners and sensors to understand when does botrytis form and how can you recognize it in a very early stage. So you can't always prevent it, but can you see it under UV or something or like a special scanner that can say, hey, it's coming. So if you cut this flower away now, you may prevent a lot of trouble. So yeah, there's, that, there's a that should be uh, something we should have in hand, but unfortunately it's not there yet, but I hear that um, companies are looking into it, yeah. so uh, yeah. if it would be there, then I think all the growers can be happy and uh, make use of it. Yeah. Mm. Um, um, I have a question from the online community. Uh, René, well, how do you look to defoliation, uh, taking leaves off of the crop? Um, what are the latest findings around it? Uh, how do I think about it? Well. When you have a very small room, it's possible to do, but when you have 10,000 plants, it will be very difficult. So basically, you want to uh, grow your plant and do as little uh, labor on it as possible. So I can imagine that maybe in certain uh, situations that you will do this, yes, the lower leaves, because they take energy and they don't give energy uh, anymore, so, so they don't give a supply of energy, but uh, in general, I should say, uh, make a quick growing schedule and try to avoid it. Yeah, and so also all other actions on uh, making the design of the plant by hand, yeah, try to avoid it. Yeah, that was my second question. How does your ideal plant look like? Then? So my ideal plant uh, looks like, uh, uh, so what we've noticed in trials, that uh, growing speed is tremendous and that, uh, so I prefer uh, a plant, for example, with long day, uh, maybe five, maximum seven days and not longer, so you can keep the growth in control instead of what I sometimes see is that people uh, give uh, three to four weeks uh, long day and then you get the situation that it's, it can come become out of control. Yeah. So I, I want to have it compact, I want to have it open, and of course limit the amount of leaves. The more long days, the more leaves you will have. Yeah, so it's a combination of factors which are determining what kind of plant you want in your facility. Um, Jeanette, uh, going to uh, your subject uh, around uh, biocontrol, um, if you look to um, putting biocontrol into the, the growing facility. I hear sometimes from growers, for example, in uh, Denmark, medicinal cannabis, that they are afraid of having any uh, potential biological um, species in the final product. 
How do you look at that from corporate point of view? Uh, good, good question. Uh, well, uh, the, the natural enemies we are using are that small. Um, I don't think you will find them back. And also the uh, uh, experience we have is that um, the predatory might stay on the leaves and not in the flowers. And this, uh, so, uh, well, you are especially harvesting the flowers, of course, also the leaves. But in that case, they, they will be, will be uh, especially when you dry it, they will be killed and, and not, n no, well, not visible anymore. So that will be no problem at all. Okay, good to know. I think it's a question which pops up quite frequently at uh, growers. That's true, yeah. Are there more questions from the audience? <laughs> yeah, it's on. It's on. Now, now it is. <laughs> uh, Arno, you were talking about uh, Botrytis resistance. Uh, is, isn't... Isn't the solution in the long run to develop varieties which are truly botrytis resistant? That is, uh, David, that's a really good question because yes, you can try to prevent it or you can try to treat it, but uh, I do believe part of my own research was to find out how terpenes may be related to, uh, to disease uh, uh, proneness of the plant. And I do believe that there's certain terpenes that are present in some varieties that make plants more resistant to botrytis. Because it's an observation of many growers that some plants always have it and some plants never have it. And it could be have something to do with sativa and indica, but that only makes sense if we are certain something is a sativa or an indica. But if we're not certain because the terminology is unclear, then that's difficult. So you have to go into the chemical measurements to see what's the, yeah, what's the relationship between those two. Yeah. Is it on? Yes, it's on. It, with Mildow, for example, they've recently discovered uh, resistant genes and susceptibility. They found two susceptibility genes for Mildow in cannabis, and they found one that is resistant, it's dominant, it just doesn't show up in those plants. Well, the, the research needs to be done, and, and we know a lot about plants in general, but cannabis just came out of the shadows, so we have a lot of uh, science to apply to cannabis that has not been done, because only a few countries have been doing it only for a few years, so there's, there's lots to learn, and I'm sure uh, we'll discover those, uh, those traits in cannabis plants as well. Yeah. Um, extra question coming in uh, from the online community, Ben, is something uh, for you, I think. Yeah. Um, is there a benefit of flushing at the end of the crop? Well, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. a question with, uh, I would say the world of cannabis is divided into, I would say, 50-50. Some say yes, some say no. In my opinion, not really, but certainly the ones that they do, they have a reason. Maybe for the ones that they pro probably they smoke, maybe they, they like to have flushing, but most of research is, who, are, who are done, they haven't proven any benefit on, on that, so. Yeah. I uh, you were uh, knocking, uh, René, well, how do you look at it? The, well, uh, the only thing I always hear from, uh, from plant growing view, I should say, it's not interesting at all. The only thing I always hear is from the people who are smoking. They say, well, when you flush, the taste is softer. Mm. That's yeah. the only thing what I hear. And that's, well, so I always say when we are going to do trials, we need a test panel uh, of these kinds of things uh, yeah. to, to test also the post-harvest uh, conditions. Volunteer. Volunteers. <laughs> <there. Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I think uh, we clearly need more research, and I'm happy yes. to see that all of you are involved with uh, cannabis research here in the mm. Netherlands, but also abroad, so that we can find more uh, information about it. And I think that is uh, truly one of the key aspects that everybody is looking into, because we need to have evidence for certain reasons why we should, yeah. for example, use flushing. But um, th 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 just something uh, more to tell about it. What you basically see, of course, because it was a basement crop, there's a lot of focus on nutrients and these kinds of things. While there is not a lot of focus, there has been on uh, climate control and these kinds of things. So you see a lot of strange thoughts, in our opinion. I think you also agree. Yeah. A lot of strange thoughts 
about all kinds of uh, nutrients, fertilizer related things, mm. and not about climate. Yeah. Are there more questions uh, in the audience? Don't see many people raising their hands. Um, maybe one for you, Arno. Um, you did a lot of research into uh, cannabis and its medicinal application. What is the role of uh, cannabinoids uh, together with terpenes? Is that something you already looked into a bit more because everybody knows terpenes, flavonoids, but can you express a bit more about these terms? Well, you know, there's a way to talk about cannabis in words, sativa and indica and head high and body high, and then you can have a whole story about it. And there's a way to look at it in terms of chemistry. And then you can make great graphs and, and, and measurements and things. And it would be great if the words and the graphs, they tell the same story. So my own research showed once that sativa and indica are real categories. Everybody agrees they exist. But the claim was in that time, five to 10 years ago, that probably Indica has more CBD, it's more relaxing, and, and Sativa has more THC because it's more uplifting. So of course it must be CBD. And I thought, hey, that's something you can measure. You say something in words, but you can test it in a lab. And I found that within 400 samples of Sativa and Indica, really dominant strains, there's no difference in THC, CBD. High THC, almost no CBD. Not a surprise to anyone. But there are certain clusters of terpenes, not just one or two, but a group that is more linked to sativa is more indica. So I think that yes, terpenes, they create the, tel the taste and the smell and therefore the experience, but they really do something with steering you high in this direction or steering you high in that direction. So I think uh, terpenes are really important. I don't know if, if tiny little differences between one and another variety uh, makes it really different. Because if that's true, then I take a white widow and I let it dry mm -hmm. for a day and then I turn it into a purple haze because mm -hmm. I changed the terpenes and everybody would say like, no, that's not the case. So tiny differences I don't think make a, make a huge difference. But as a chemical group, alcoholic terpenes versus non-alcoholic terpenes, that creates clusters. And, yeah. and I think there's a lot of work to be done. That's why I'm very happy with the experiment into legalization of recreational growth, because that gives us a chance to take all that chemical data that we also yep. still are going to do in the future and link it to actual user experiences, because now that's becoming a legal market. Yeah. So, so we do need taste panels, and we do need people to really test the yeah. you know, Then the we can make next step as an industry. Yes. Um, uh, Jeanette, question for you. Uh, pests uh, are, of course, everywhere. Um, if you look to the North American market and European market, do you see a difference in, um, uh, for example, is the aphid more present in um, North America or maybe you look more at caterpillars at the other side of the world? I, I, do you see the same popping up everywhere or? Uh, well, in, in well, what we have seen in the, especially the Ferodon was uh, in, in first of all a big problem in Canada and the US. Uh, and we do have uh, a specific um, uh, aphid species here as well, but these are mainly other species, although we can wait that for Odin will be, will be here as well. I don't know for sure if they're already mentioned, probably yes. Uh, and uh, what we have seen here that uh, also other, other uh, pests popped up like uh, uh, thrip species, different thrip species actually. Uh, and also a lot of white fly. So it depends a little bit on the situation, on the region where you are, uh, if there's a lot of in-flight from outside, like you, you know, we have very uh, big concentration here of greenhouses close together. So then it pops up that, that when there is a tomato grower close by or cucumber, you can get these, these pests on your, your cannabis as well. And, and actually cannabis is a kind of yeah, oh, oh, it's a wheat, I should say. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you see, all the pests can can survive on cannabis. So uh, that's in, in some cases quite challenging. Uh, but when you have a short crop cycle, what you have in nine weeks or even maybe shorter, then the the chance that the the, uh, the pest will develop well well is smaller because the the life cycle is quite short. However, it's still very very important to do good monitoring and find out if there's any pest available and think preventively. So think preventive how to approach your problems which you have seen in the past, how to approach these with natural enemies. Because when you do it on the preventive way, well, you can do it quite easily probably 
um, and, and, and when you do it curatively. So as soon as you see the pest and then introduce your natural enemies, you are always too late. So then it, yeah. it goes far and then you have to drop it down it, and it costs a lot of money. So when you start at the beginning, then your, your levels stay low and that's, that's well, and then it's more cost effective as well. Yeah, I think scouting is indeed a crucial element Definitely. of your biological program. Um, going to the last question uh, for you, Ben. Uh, talking about, uh, you talked about EC levels. What, what do you look at uh, for a cannabis crop? You, in propagation versus uh, flowering, is there a difference in EC level? Yeah, normally, uh, let's say you, will, yeah, in propagation, you start with a low EC because the plant is small, doesn't really need that m many nutrients. So, yeah, more or less, we start with EC of 1.6 to 1.8. And then we gradually increase in the vegetative stage to 2 to 2.6. And then the, yeah, by the maybe first week of flowering, we end up at 2.8 to 3 and just it, keep it like that. So it's important is not only what you give, but as well how you build it up in the substrate to make sure that uh, as soon as you go from vegetative to flowering, you, have, you change the photo period, but at the same time, so with a bit of higher EC that you build up in the, in the substrate, in the media, you tell the plant that, yeah, it's time now to, to switch mode of from vegetative to, to generative. So it's, yeah, it's quite important, actually. Yeah. OK, thank you uh, for your input. Then uh, we're coming to the end of this session. I really want to thank you all here on stage for your presence and for your valuable information. And I want to also thank you, the audience, uh, for your presence. So thank you. Thank you. Hope to meet you. <laughs>